Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not just a place we're all going to, which it is, but he said the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom of God, he also said, is within you. And to think that we're a part of this eternal kingdom, God's kingdom. We're going to be looking at a story in the Bible today, and Jesus had a lot to say about the kingdom of God, and he says a lot about the kingdom of God in this story that we're going to read together here in just a little bit in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. First of all, I want to say it's truly great to be back. Uh, this past month, my wife and I, thank you. My wife and I were supposed to be on what uh, we call in the church circle a sabbatical, which is an extended time of rest and rejuvenation. Uh, my experience was anything but a sabbatical. It was a sad battle, is what I call it. Uh, I had a medical emergency uh, the second day into our uh, vacation. We were in Park City, Utah, beautiful place, never been to Utah, and uh, had this medical emergency. Next thing I know, I'm in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, spending the night in the hospital. I don't want to bore you with uh, the, the details, but uh, the next day I find myself in our hotel room with my legs swollen, a hematoma. I had a torn quad muscle, the vastus intermedius, which I never knew existed, and I've become intimately acquainted with my vastus intermedius. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with my vastus intermedius. Um, and so I found myself flat on my back, and uh, thank God for a good help meet that has been there along the way, uh, every moment of the day, serving me really hand and foot. I don't even know if I want to recover from this uh, injury. Uh, because my wife has served me so amazingly. Uh, thankfully, my, my injury didn't require surgery, just about six to eight weeks to really heal up. And I even hesitate to share that story with you because I know today, I know today in this service there are people that are going through a much more serious health crisis or you've been through a much more serious health crisis. A couple weeks ago, I was in a doctor's office, uh, office for an appointment my wife was there with me, and in walked in this, uh, young woman, this young mother with her two daughters. And uh, we got to talk and come to find out she attends Trinity here. She's a single mom, and I said, so what are you in here for? And uh, she pulled her blouse down a little bit, and there was a large scar there. She said, I had open heart surgery eight weeks ago. And I'm like, wow. Like, open heart surgery eight weeks ago, and she's standing, walking, she's full of life, vibrant, and I'm thinking, that's amazing. Please don't ask me what I'm in here for. <laughs> but sure enough, it came around to, so what are you in here for? Uh, torn muscle, no big deal. I felt like crawling out of the doctor's office at that time, you know? So it really isn't, uh, at the end of the day, really isn't a big deal. And, you know, the body's prone to health, and thank God that our bodies want to heal, and that's the way God created us. Um, as I was leaving the, uh, the hospital, one of the medical personnel said, so how'd this happen? I said, I was mountain biking. And he said, see, and he was somewhat out of shape. He said, see, you should just stay home, sit on the sofa, watch TV, eat more chips, drink more beer. This wouldn't have happened to you. <laughs> I thought, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> and it reminded me of a saying of, uh, that Mark Twain came up with. They asked Mark Twain, they said, do you ever get any exercise? He said, yes, whenever I am invited to be a pallbearer at my friend's funerals who did exercise. So uh, this experience, you know, sometimes in life when you find yourself flat on your back, it gives you a lot of time for introspection, a lot of time to think. And uh, as I was flat on my back, I was thinking, you know, man, how did I get here? How did I get here? You know, I try to do everything right, eat right, exercise. And, uh, you know, you go to all these wonderful doctors, and thank God for all the medical personnel. I mean, from the emergency room to my, my primary care physician here in Lubbock and everybody in between, y you that are involved in the medical field, you guys are awesome. We hope that we never have to see you, but when we do see you, we thank God that you are so good at what you do. Let's give a hand to all of our men and women that uh, are in the medical field. They couldn't give me the cause. I, they were treating the symptom like, okay, I know, a torn vastus intermedius, and I know it was really severe, hematoma, okay, put this on, do this, okay, here are some pain pills. Have fun with them, the doctor said. I didn't know what he meant by that until I started taking some of that oxycodone. I'm like, okay. Lord, take me off this. Amen. <laughs> and uh, they can't give you the, the reason, you know. It's like, kind of like the gray area of medicine. The cause, the cause. And so I just kind of came up with, you know, I'm a 50-year-old I'm a man with a 30-year-old mind, and I just need to close the gap between how old I really am and how young I think I am. 
sad thing on. My wife was on the same bike ride, and she didn't get injured. But anyway, <laughs> uh, as I was flat on my back, I thought, you know, how'd I get here? And then I started thinking about America and what America's going through, and she's injured right now. This nation is severely injured. And uh, I know I'm going to get better, and I know I am healing, and, and my hope and prayer is, can America get better, and will, where Amer- will America heal? And as I was thinking about how how did I get here, I was thinking about as a nation, how did we get here? How did we get here? And the Lord took me to a a section of Scripture, and he gave me an answer, a very clear response to that question. And I want to share that with you today. It's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. And here's what the Holy Scriptures say. Here's another story Jesus told. Jesus uh, was the greatest teacher of all time because he could tell great stories. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night, as the workers slept, his enemy came in and planted weeds among the wheat and then slipped away. When the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew. Then the farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted that good seed is full of weeds. And the question, where'd they come from? And the answer, let's read it out loud together, An enemy has done this. Say it again. An enemy has done this. And the worker said, should we pull out the weeds? No, he replied. You'll uproot the wheat if you do. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds and tie them into bundles and burn them and to put the wheat in the barn. Let's pray. God, we thank you for giving us supernatural attention to to really focus on the one thing that matters now more than anything else, and that's what the Holy Spirit is saying through Holy Scripture in our lives today. So, Lord, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit with pinpoint accuracy that you would bring that divine truth into our hearts and into our lives and that we would make it a part of our lives moving forward. I pray and ask your grace now in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. What is a parable? A parable... Is a, spir- is a earthly story with a spiritual meaning, an earthly story with a spiritual application. But a parable could also include a prophetic message to it. This one is not only an earthly story that Jesus told that has a spiritual application that we're going to be exploring together today, but it also has a prophetic uh, aspect to it also. Now, a couple of things jump out at us right away when we read this story, and, and the first thing is this. We all have a field that we've been assigned to. We all have a field that we're working in. Uh, the, the field uh, of your own soul, the cultivation of your own soul, the, the field of your marriage if you're married, the field of parenting if you are a parent. And all of us are assigned to a field. Maybe the field that you're assigned to presently is you're finishing your education. Uh, maybe the field that you are currently assigned to is your place of work, your business, your ministry, the church that you and I are a part of, And ultimately, the world itself is the field that Jesus is ultimately referring to in this story. And we'll look at the interpretation that Jesus gave his disciples here in just a moment. The second thing that we recognize, as we are busy plowing our field and laboring in our field and toiling in our field and planting good seed in our field and watering that seed, and then like a good farmer being patient for the harvest, while we sleep, an enemy comes in to sabotage our work, and our labor of love. And so in the story, Jesus is reminding us that as you are faithful to sow good seed in that field, there's going to be some weeds. Why? Because we have an enemy. We have a stealthy enemy, an unseen enemy that comes and at night sows seeds or tares amongst the wheat. You know, when you look at the landscape of America today, you have to ask yourself, how did we get here? Well, the seeds or the weeds of destruction were planted in this nation a generation ago when the sexual revolution started. And now we're seeing the harvest of those seeds that were planted, those seeds of destruction that were planted a generation ago. And here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. He said, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If we sow to the flesh, of the flesh will reap destruction. But if we sow to the Spirit, of the Spirit will reap eternal life. So God is not mocked. There are certain laws, spiritual laws, natural laws, that God built into creation itself. 
And one of those laws is the the seeds you sow will determine the harvest you grow. And so if we take a closer look at at the field of our life, the field of our family, the field of our marriage, the field of our mind, and the field of our thoughts, the seeds that we've been planting will determine the harvest that we're experiencing. If we don't like the harvest that we're experiencing, then the good news is we simply need to start sowing good seed in that field. And if you sow good seed long enough in that field and you water that seed, God is the God of increase. He will increase that seed. And we didn't didn't share that verse with you, but the very next verse of Galatians 6, 9, it says, And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you don't give up. I want to challenge you to continue to be faithful to sow good seed in the field that God has assigned you to. And it may not look like anything's happening, but I want you to know that there's a miracle of growth in that seed. And as you plant that seed in fertile soil, and as you water that seed, God's going to give that seed increase, and there's a harvest coming in your future. A good harvest that God has for you. But we sowed the seeds of destruction a generation ago, and so now today in America, gay marriage is legal. How did we get here? What happened? While we slept, an enemy has done this. The latest craze in our nation today is transgenderism. Uh, Recently, Bruce Jenner was awarded a a ESPY award, uh, Author Ash ESPY award of, of courage in sports. And I was in the hotel room and my legs propped up and I'm on the muscle relaxers and the painkillers that the doctors gave me and I'm watching this story and they show a clip and I'm like, whoa, this is Bruce Jenner. You know, I idolized him when I was a kid. And here's Bruce Jenner dressed like a woman but talking like a man. Here's Bruce Jenner dressed like a woman, talking like a man, with all the parts of a man still, and yet he thinks he's a woman. And I thought I was hallucinating. I thought they gave me some pretty powerful drugs. I'm like, Glory, get in here. Am I seeing what I'm seeing? Please get me in touch with reality. And it is the new norm. It is the new reality. And what's shocking to me as a 52-year-old man What alarms me is the message that's being sent to this young generation, to the millennials, because now they're normalizing it. The world is now normalizing something that is highly abnormal, and they're saying it's okay, and it's not okay. God has a better way, God has a better plan, and God has a purpose for your life other than that. And I think, how'd we get here while we slept? An enemy has done this. I was on the news, Christianity Today, and and I found out that there's a school district in Oregon, a school district in Oregon that will be providing a same, uh, that will be providing a sex change operation to minors without their parents' consent. You heard me right. I mean, teenagers can't get an aspirin without parental consent. They can't get a tattoo. They can't, they can't get body piercing without parental uh, 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 consent. But now there's a school district in Oregon that's going to provide sex change for minors without their parents, their parents' consents? How did we get here? While we slept, an enemy has done this. And then the worst thing I think I have ever heard The worst video I think I have ever seen is what recently was in the news this past week regarding Planned Parenthood. How they delicately provide an abortion procedure to kill a baby and they do it in such a way that they're able to harvest the organs of that aborted child so they could sell those organs for a profit? Are you kidding me? The Nazis weren't as sophisticated in their barbarism. As evil and hideous as ISIS is, ISIS, I don't think, has even gone to those extremes. And shame on the United States of America and shame on any politician that continues to allow taxpayer money to fund such a place as Planned Parenthood. It needs to stop and stop now because those are my dollars and those are your dollars. 
And I think, how'd we get here? While we slept, an enemy has done this. But this story is, is also about our life. It's about you, it's about me. That as we look at the field of our own life, our own soul, if we're honest today, there's not only a harvest of wheat that's growing, but there are also some weeds. But don't panic, don't freak out. All of us are the same. I pray there's more wheat in your life and in my life than there are weeds. But I know there are some weeds in your life. And you better know there are some weeds in my life because nobody gets through this life without a few weeds here and there. But may you have more wheat. And may you allow God to continue to grow a greater harvest of wheat in your life than weeds in your life. And sometimes we look at our life and maybe you're struggling with an addiction today. Maybe it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs or pornography or sex or a thousand and one other things that, as Kaylee so beautifully sang that song during the offertory, that anything that we think of more than God in our life can become an idol. That whatever you may be struggling with in your life, sometimes you may look at your life and you're like, how'd I get here? Maybe you're going through a very difficult period in your marriage right now, and I want to provide hope and encouragement that no matter how bad it is, if you will give God space and give God room and, and invite him into that marriage relationship, he can bring healing, he can bring restoration. Sometimes you come to a place in your life, in your marriage, and you ask, how'd I get here? How'd this happen? While well, we slept, an enemy has done this. And we have a real enemy, a stealthy enemy who at night comes to sabotage the plan of God and the purpose of God in all of our lives and to wreak havoc in the field of our life. So what's the interpretation of this story that Jesus told? Well, after the crowds disappeared and Jesus was alone with his disciples, Jesus gave the interpretation of this parable not to the public but, but in private to his disciples. So go to verse 36 of Matthew 13 and here's what it says. Then leaving the crowds outside, Jesus went into the house. His disciples said, please, explain to us the story of the weeds in the field. And Jesus replied, the Son of Man is the farmer who plants the good seed. Who is the one in your life and in my life, in your family and in my family, in your marriage and in my marriage, in your kids and in my kids, in your church and in our church, and in our, in our nation and in our world, who is it that comes to plant good seed? Jesus very clearly tells us it's God that comes to plant good seed. God is the planter of good seed in our world. He's the planter of good seed in your life. And if there's any bad seed in my life or bad seed in your life or bad seed in our world, it doesn't come from God. God is only a sower of good seed because he's a good God and everything that God does is good, very good. Can we thank God for his goodness? Verse 38, the field is the world and the good seed represents the people of the kingdom. That's you. That's me. God describes us as people of the kingdom. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of God that's not of this world, but one day will be of this world. For thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It, isn't, it has not occurred yet, but it will occur, and we are people of that eternal kingdom. Nations rise, nations fall, kingdoms come, and kingdoms go. But God's kingdom is a kingdom that can never be shaken, and a kingdom that will never end. And then Jesus said, the weeds, the weeds, who are the weeds? What are the weeds? They're the people who belong to the evil one. You know, there are people in the world today that belong to the devil. Uh, well, Pastor Carl, I thought, like, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We can all become God's children. But I didn't start off as God's child. I started off as the devil's child. They made the movie Omen after me. <laughs> Damien was my spiritual name. I had more of the devil in me than, than I had Jesus in me. I've told you the story, true story. I asked my mom to verify it a few weeks ago when I was in town. She put me in a Catholic school in kindergarten. 
The nuns told her, I don't know, we don't know what to do with your son. We think he has a devil. <laughs> ah, pray for the nuns. <laughs> but we all start out as, as Jesus said in John 8, 44, you're of your father, the devil. But thank God we can change masters. Thank God we can change fathers. And God can become our father when we turn our heart to Jesus and bow ourselves at the foot of the cross and receive his grace and mercy, amen? And it goes on, the harvest is the end of the world. The harvesters are the angels. And just as the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the world. We are fast approaching the end of the world. I believe more than ever, I am more certain more than ever this is the final generation that will usher in the coming of Jesus. This is real. This is what is happening. And soon God will send out his angels and they will separate the weeds from the weed. And the weeds are sorted out and burned in the fire and so it will be at the end of the world. Verse 41, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will remove from his kingdom everything that causes sin in all who do evil. And the angels will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ouch. You know, this is Jesus talking. Okay? Now, thank God, uh, verse 42 doesn't apply to any of you. It applied to some people in the classic service and last night, but, but not in this one. Everyone in here today, verse 43 applies to you. So I want us to read this out loud together. Here we go. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Oh, doesn't that sound good? Let's do that again. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their Father's kingdom. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Do you have ears to hear today? Has God granted you and God blessed you with ears to hear? Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today and understand the meaning of this story. So I, I believe there are three things the Lord is, is really wanting us to look at in this story today where our own lives are concerned. Number one, what do you see? When you look out at the field of your life or you look out at the field of this world, what do you see? I'll tell you what Jesus sees. According to this story, and it gives me such hope, when Jesus looks at the field of the world, he doesn't see the world, a field filled with weeds where wheat is growing. No. Jesus sees this world he sees the field of this world, a field of wheat where some weeds are growing. Not a field of weeds where there's some wheat, but a field of wheat where there is some weeds. And how me know, it's a world of difference. I hope when you look at your life, you don't see your life and all you focus on are the weeds. I hope that you look at your life and you focus on the wheat because I'm here to tell you and I'm here to remind you there's more wheat then there is weeds, and as you grow the wheat, you can kill the weeds. Amen. And as we look at the world, sometimes all we hear is the bad stuff and the bad people, and we can become very discouraged if we're not careful. We can get like Elijah found himself spiritually in the doldrums. Spiritually, he was in the spiritual dumps. And there's a time in Elijah's life that he just wanted to call it quits. He wanted to give up. He wanted to throw in the towel. Why? Because he felt as though he was all alone. And God had to remind Elijah. He said, Elijah, I have 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal nor have kissed him. You're not alone in this. There are many others who are just as on fire for Jesus as you are on fire for Jesus. So don't let the world put out your fire for Jesus. Come on, church. There are yet thousands upon thousands that have not bowed their knee to Baal, nor have kissed him. There are more for us than is with the enemy. See the wheat. Focus on the wheat. Grow the wheat, and the weeds will take care of themselves. But if all you see are the weeds, and all you do is obsess over the weeds, and if all you do is talk about the weeds, and then they're going to get bigger. The weeds are going to die out. Don't let that happen. Number two, there is a difference between wheat and weeds. And Jesus makes a strong contrast between the two. Matter of fact, I love the teaching style of Jesus. He would always contrast uh, the wise builder from the foolish builder, uh, the sand foundation from the rock 
foundation, the five wise virgins, the five, the five unwise virgins, the, the sheep and the goats. He always made contrast between the younger brother and the elder brother. And, and once again, in this story, he contrasts the wheat from the tares or the wheat from the weeds. And what's the difference between wheat and, and weeds? Well, at least there are three differences, important differences that we need to take a closer look at. First of all, uh, wheat always grows in the row that it's planted in. Uh, there's really nothing that's attractive to look out at a field, a, a harvest field of, of cotton or a harvest field of wheat. And you see row after row after row of, of the seed that was planted, and now it's harvest time. It's harvest time. And I believe prophetically that we are reaching that place of harvest time in the world today. That I pray that the wheat is getting weedier even as the weeds may be getting weedier. But I pray that we as the wheat stalks of the kingdom of God planted in the field of this world, that we will let our light shine brighter than it's ever shined before. And thank God, the darker it gets in the world, that just allows your light to shine that much brighter. And may we be the healthiest wheat. And may we be planted in our rows. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, church, you know, uh, we're seated in rows here, right? I just like, I don't know if it's the pain medicine or what, but I can just look out and I can just see wheat growing, stalks of healthy wheat growing. And it's a process. Growth and the miracle of life and the growth in the seed is a process. And, and so... We all grow, and we're all at different stages, spiritually speaking. But we grow in our rows. And you need to grow where you're planted. And you, you never look out at a field and see, you know, one stalk of wheat, right? It's always in, in bundles, in bunches, because we're stronger together than we are by ourselves. And if you've ever been tempted to stay away from the church... Now's not the time to stay away from the church. Now's the time for us to find our road, to find our place, to get rooted, to get grounded, to get planted in that place so that we can grow. And we can be like Psalm 1 where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the, scorn of the scornful, but his or her delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law they meditate day and night. They shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. They'll bring forth their fruit in its season. Their leaf shall not wither. And every Everything they do shall prosper in Jesus' name. Look to your neighbor and say, everything you do shall prosper. Tell them that. Everything you do shall prosper. Why? Because you are wheat planted in your row, and your roots are going down deep in Jesus' name. Now weeds, you know, weeds can grow anywhere, any place, any time. Weeds are automatic. Wheat's not automatic. Planting wheat's got to be intentional. Planting wheat is, is hard work. Farming is, is hard work. And you have to learn how to be patient because you don't plant today and get a harvest tomorrow. Are you listening to me? You don't plant good seeds in your marriage today and then, well, in a week I'm going to start seeing the results. No, you've got to keep planting and keep watering and keep planting and keep watering and keep planting and keep watering. But I guarantee you one thing, God is not mocked. As you continue to sow good seeds, you're going to reap a great harvest in Jesus' name. So don't be weary in well-doing. Matter of fact, Galatians 6, 9, it goes on right there, the very next verse after the verses that we read just a moment ago, verses 7 and 8 says, Therefore, don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you don't faint. So don't faint. Don't give up. So there's a difference between weeds and wheat. Wheat grows in rows. Weeds can just grow anywhere, anytime, anyplace. You simply don't have to do anything, and you're going to get a, a, a harvest field full of weeds. The second thing is wheat follows the rules. There are certain rules to to planting and to harvest, and wheat obeys the farmer's commands. Wheat obeys, the seed obeys how it was genetically designed by its creator. And the wheat doesn't try to become something other than what it was genetically designed by its creator to be. And we were genetically designed by our creator to be wheat, to be members of his kingdom, of his eternal kingdom, to be his sons and to be his daughters. And so as as true followers of Christ, it means we are obeying the farmer's rules. We are obeying the Ten Commandments. We are obeying the teachings of, of Scripture. And that's what really differentiates the wheat from the weeds or the tares. You know, in the Middle East and in the time of Christ, Jesus was talking about 
tares. And there's another word, darnel. Darnel was a poisonous plant, and it was biologically related to wheat. What Jesus was describing in the story was a particular plant that was biologically uh, related to wheat, and therefore it was hard to distinguish, really, until they were full grown, the tares and the wheat, because the tares kind of looked like the wheat. And sometimes from afar, we may look the part, but as we get closer and God looks closer into our life, are we truly exemplifying the evidence of being a Christ follower? And you see, really, at the end of the day, it's hard for us to differentiate. You see, the reason that we're not in the weed-pulling business is what I might think is a weed is really a weed, and what I might think is a weed is really a weed. Because sometimes it's hard for us to differentiate and distinguish between the weed and the weeds. So if we start pulling out some weeds, we might pull out some wheat with the weeds. So we got to wait till the harvest. Because it's really only God that can distinguish and differentiate between weed and weeds. I hope all of you are wheat, but there may be some weeds among us. I mean, at the end of the day, we really don't know. That's why the Bible says examine yourself to see whether or not in you're in the faith. You see, my wife prays for me, and I'm thankful that she prays for me, and my wife believes and she hopes that I truly am wheat. But really, only God and Carl knows if I'm truly wheat. I look at my wife, and I see the evidence of a, of, a, of a Christ follower, but at the end of the day, I really don't know if she's really wheat or weeds. It's only going to take place at the end when Jesus separates the sheep from the goats and I hope that I'm in the row of sheep and I hope she's in the row of sheep but really I don't know and she doesn't know. We're just hoping that we really are wheat because it's hard for me to look at your life and say yes you're wheat or, or no you're a weed because I really don't know but God knows how to separate the wheat from the weeds because sometimes the wheat look like weeds and act like weeds but really they're wheat and sometimes weeds look like weeds and act like weeds but really they're weeds. So we're not in the business of trying to separate the wheat from the tares. God knows how to do it and he'll do it at the end of the days. Amen. So we're in the business of celebrating wheat. We're in the business of growing wheat. We are in the wheat planting business, and that's what Trinity Church is going to be about until Jesus comes. But one way we can know whether you really are the real deal or not, if you love me, Jesus said, you'll keep my commandments. And number three, the difference between wheat and weeds Wheat multiplies by planting. Wheat multiplies. The farmer plants the seed and the crop and the harvest will ensue. Not so with weeds. Some weeds multiply by spreading their seed through the air, on the back of, lo of the local winds. Some weeds spread their bounty when wildlife eat, will eat the seeds and then travel for miles, expelling the seeds from their mouth or droppings. Some weeds multiply by having such a deep-rooted system that nothing can eliminate the roots and therefore they always survive. Weeds are pesty creatures. And Jesus is saying they're here to stay. So don't focus on the weeds. Focus on the wheat. And finally, number three, what are you growing? What are you growing? Yeah, you could, you could do it right. You could play by the rules. You could do it right. But while you sleep, the enemy still will come and plant some weeds among your wheat. So you know what, church family? When the weeds start showing up in your life, don't panic. When the weeds start showing up in your marriage, don't panic. When the weeds start showing up in your churches, don't panic. When the weeds start showing up in your children, don't panic. Keep focusing on the wheat. Keep planting good seed. Keep watering that good seed. And know that God will continue to give the increase. And don't be weary in well-doing. Do what you know to do. Play by the rules. Do it God's way. And in the end, in the end, you will have a beautiful harvest of wheat because God is sovereign and God is faithful. Can we thank God for the beautiful harvest of wheat? So the way you take care of the weeds is by growing healthy wheat. You see, healthy wheat will keep the sun from shining on the weeds and will absorb the water that the weeds need to survive and thrive. So the healthier the wheat, the less the weeds. And so I want to challenge you. I want to challenge myself. I want to challenge every man in here. Be the best stock of wheat you could possibly be in the row that God has planted you, in the field that God has planted you. 
And let's not play games with God. Let's be, let's be weedier as wheat than the weeds are as weeds. Sometimes I look at the weeds in our world today and it seems as though they're, they're more audacious, outspoken, brazen, and emboldened in promoting their weed philosophy, their weed thinking, their weed living, than wheat is. And so I think we need to get weedier. And so let's get more serious for God than we've ever been before. Let's make the devil's remaining years on planet Earth until he's cast into that bottomless pit for, the, for a thousand years, then ultimately banished in the lake of fire. Let's make the final years of the devil's existence on planet Earth a living hell. Can we do that? You say, how do I do that, Pastor? Just love God more than you've ever loved God. Guys, love your wives. Love your families. Quit walking out on them. Quit fooling around. Cut out the adulterous affairs. Some of you women, too, you listen to me. Quit walking out on your husbands. Quit walking out on your families. The grass is not greener on the other side. You can make the grass as green as you want it on the side that you're on right now, okay? All right? Stand by one another. Love one another. There is no difficulty you're facing in your life or your marriage right now that God cannot heal and, and, and or restore. You say, well, what, Pastor Carl, what if, what if we've already gone through a terrible divorce? What if it's already too late? Well, that chapter of your life has come to a close. But there are many new chapters yet to be written. So what lessons can you harvest from your past? What lessons can you harvest from your past that will help you plan and work towards a better future in the months and years to come? The past is the past. The future is yet to be determined, and you can determine what that future is going to be. And my challenge to you, and for, with all the love in my heart to you, is plant the best seeds you've ever planted in the new field that you may find yourself in. And I promise you, God is faithful. He'll give you the greatest harvest you could ever have imagined. The greatest harvest you could have ever have imagined. There's always hope. There's always hope. And it's not too late. So don't live in the past. Don't always talk about the weeds. Don't focus on the weeds. Focus on the harvest, the new harvest that God's going to give you. And if you're here today, you see, the rules have changed now in how we do church. The rules have changed on how we're going to perform wedding ceremonies here at Trinity. And from this moment forward, the only weddings that we're going to be able to schedule and the only weddings that we're going, to able to, we're going to be able to legally perform are for members in good standing, which means you're going to have to be a member in good standing. You're going to have to go through our next step uh, membership class. You're going to have to sign uh, a, a covenant relationship that you are doing your best to follow Jesus and to obey the teachings of Jesus and to obey the teachings of Scripture. And if, that, if, if there is any open sin in your life, whether it's heterosexual sin or homosexual sin or any other kind of sin, that you're going to confess that sin to God and that uh, you're going to receive the support, love, and help that we will offer you as a church to become whole, spirit, soul, and body. But, but moving forward, we, we, we cannot make a, a, a couple a member in good standing if they're not following the teachings of Scripture, which means this, guys. If you're shacking up with a lady right now and you're living in sin, it's wrong. You need to repent. You need to ask that woman you're living with for forgiveness. And you need to reassess what the relationship's going to look like moving forward. 
And if you've been living together for an extended period of time and you have children, then I'm going to tell you what to do. Make it right in the eyes of God. Get married. We'll do everything we can to help you, okay? We'll even do it for free if we have to, okay? We'll help you. Well, I, I don't know. I don't agree with that, Pastor. God, God's a God of love, and, uh, you know, he, he, he looks past my sin. Give me a, a verse for that, please. You're, you're making it up now. The Bible doesn't say that. Yes, God loves you, and because he loves you, he expects you to call sin for what it is and then to honor God and do what's right in the eyes of God. And listen, marriage is more than a license. It's more than a certificate. It is a covenant relationship. And so moving forward, any and every marriage that we will do in this church will be between one man and one woman before a holy God as an act of worship and obedience to the teachings of Scripture. You're like, Pastor Carr, you're making me feel real uncomfortable that I'm doing my job. Now I'm going to make it real easy for you. Take a moment, look at that woman you've been living with and say, we're going to do what's right. Will you marry me? What a better place to propose than in church. <laughs> Amen. Matter of fact, we're going to help you out. We're, we're looking at how we can have a mass wedding here at Trinity. Amen. We believe in you. But we believe in God's definition of marriage. We need to be the first ones to start honoring that and defending that and making it a priority in our lives. Can I have every head bowed, every eye closed? Father, we humbly come before you tonight, today. Lord, I pray for men and women that may have some pretty predominant weeds growing in their life right now. Maybe an addiction to alcohol, or drug abuse, addiction to drugs, addiction to pot, an addiction to pornography. Maybe they're involved in an immoral sexual relationship. You love them. You have them here today so they could hear the truth. It's truth that sets us free, Lord. Lord, we can't be the people that you've called us to be on our own strength. We'll fail and falter and fall time and time again. But where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. And it's not by power nor by might, but by your Spirit. And by the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace that Jesus provides, your grace is more than sufficient for whatever we may be battling or struggling or going through in our lives. And Lord, I thank you that you're giving your people hope and that, Lord, your arm can reach down into lo the lowest pit where someone may find themselves today and you can pull them up out of that miry clay and set their feet upon a rock to stay. Thank you for your grace even now, reaching out to marriages, reaching out to men, reaching out to women, bringing healing, bringing hope, Thank you, Lord, that we're going to grow more wheat and we're going to starve the weeds to death. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you can know his love, grace, and forgiveness right here, right now. Today is the day of salvation. Just pray this prayer out loud with the rest of us. Say it with your own heart. Mean it from your own. Uh, say it with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Jesus, you're the only Savior. And so I call upon you today. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my Father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. And give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we thank the Lord together?